Please turn in your copies of the scriptures to Ezra. Ezra chapter 6 will be our focus this evening, verses 1 through 15, but I will also be reading one verse from chapter 5, and that is verse 5. Hear now the word of our God. Ezra 5.5, 5. But the eye of their God was on the elders of the Jews, and they did not stop them until a report could come to Darius, and then a written reply be returned concerning it. Now moving to chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. Then King Darius issued a decree, and search was made in the archives where the treasures were stored in Babylon. In Ecbatana in the fortress, which is in the province of Media, a scroll was found, and there was written in it as follows. Memorandum. In the first year of King Cyrus, Cyrus the king issued a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the temple, the place where sacrifices are offered, be rebuilt and let its foundations be retained, its height being 60 cubits and its width 60 cubits, with three layers of huge stones and one layer of timbers, and let the cost be paid from the royal treasury. Also let the gold and silver utensils of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took from the temple in Jerusalem and brought to Babylon, be returned and brought to their places in the temple in Jerusalem, and you shall put them in the house of God. Now therefore, Tatanai, governor of the province beyond the river, Shethar, Bazanai, and your colleagues, the officials of the provinces beyond the river, keep away from there. Leave this work on the house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews rebuild this house of God on its site. Moreover, I issue a decree concerning what you are to do for these elders of Judah in the rebuilding of this house of God. The full cost is to be paid to these people from the royal treasury out of the taxes of the provinces beyond the river, and that without delay. Whatever is needed, both young bulls, rams, and lambs for a burnt offering to the God of heaven, and wheat, salt, wine, and anointing oil, as the priest in Jerusalem request, it is to be given to them daily without fail, that they may offer acceptable sacrifices to the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his sons. And I issue a decree that any man who violates this edict, a timber shall be drawn from his house, and he shall be impaled on it, and his house shall be made a refuse heap on account of this. May the God who has caused his name to dwell there overthrow any king or people who attempts to change it so as to destroy this house of God in Jerusalem. I, Darius, have issued this decree. Let it be carried out with all diligence. Then Tatanai, the governor of the province beyond the river, Shethar, Baz, and I, and their colleagues carried out the decree with all diligence, just as King Darius had sent. And the elders of the Jews were successful in building through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo. And they finished building according to the command of the God of Israel and the decree of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. This temple was completed on the third day of the month, Adar. It was the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. Thus far, the reading of God's holy and errant word. Please be seated. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now, and we ask for your blessing. We ask that you would use your word, the preaching of your word, to revitalize the hearts of your people, to encourage them, to embolden them. Lord, that you would use the foolishness of preaching to do mighty things, that you would work by your spirit in the hearts of your people, to transform them, not simply in their minds, but in our hearts, in our affections. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Amen. Okay, so last time we began looking at this remarkable passage of Scripture that really goes all the way from Ezra 4, 24 to the end of the section that I read, chapter 6, verse 15. And what the passage is showing is it's the movement from the stagnation in the building of the temple to its completion. So if, if, if you remember that the temple had ceased to be, to, to be built for 16 years, 
that the people ceased uh, doing any work on the temple until God had sent his prophets to revitalize the work in 520 BC. And then uh, about four and a half years later, the work was completed. It was finished in, uh, on March 12, 515 BC. So chapter 4 explained to us why that stagnation had happened. It was because of the opposition of the enemies of the Jews to the work of, of building. And then chapters 5 and 6, this section that we're now looking at, answers the question of why it was completed. That, that was the question that Tatanai and his colleagues were asking. By whose decree are you building this temple? Why are you building this? And the passage is answering that question. It is, it is because of God's decree. We saw last time that God worked through the preaching of his prophets. He worked through the powerful preaching of of Haggai and Zechariah, but it's also through the providence of God that God is, is working in and through the circumstances of the times to bring about his decree that this temple should be completed. So last time we, we focused on the preaching. Uh, we considered the, the doctrine and the teaching of the passage that God decrees to advance his kingdom through preaching and providence. Again, that God decrees to advance his kingdom through preaching and providence. So last time the focus was on the preaching. But this time we're going to look at God's providence. How he used his providence to bring about the completion of the building of the temple. And I think it will be helpful for us before we dive into this, this passage together to be reminded of what is providence. We're going to be talking about it. It's a word that is, is frequent in our vocabulary. There are even cities in our nations named Providence. So what is Providence? And our standards give a very helpful definition for this, that after uh, defining the, the decrees of God, that, that God accomplishes decrees through the works of creation and Providence, the Shorter Catechism asks, what are the works of Providence? And it gives this answer. God's works of Providence are his most holy, wise, and powerful preserving and governing all his creatures and all their actions. That it, it, it pertains to God's preserving and governing of his creatures and all their actions. That God preserves his creation. That the, the world and the universe is not, as the deists say, some wind-up toy that, that God spun out and after he had created it, stood back and had nothing to do with it but that no, God and his providence is intimately involved in his creation to bring about his decrees that he has ordained for his creatures. That he not only preserves it, as we learn in Hebrews chapter 1, that he upholds all things by the word of his power, but he, he also governs it, that God is governing his creation. And we see that in Acts 17, where it says that he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that God is upholding his creation, he is preserving it, and he is governing it. But you know, it's, it's not just that God did that in these four and a half years in the building of, of the temple, in the revitalization of the work of building of the temple, but this is what God does throughout the history of his creation, that God is working through providence now, if you were listening closely to the definition of providence, it says that it, it pertains to his powerful preserving and governing all his creatures and their actions. And since all of us here today are creatures of God, that means that it pertains to us. It pertains to you. It pertains to me. That God's providence affects our lives. And so as we work our way through this passage it is imperative uh, for us to remember that this doesn't just pertain to the people of, of the 6th century B.C. in Judea. It pertains to you. It pertains to me. That the principles that we are going to draw from this of God's providence are principles that we can, we can look for in our own lives as well. So I would, as we work our way through this, like to make four observations from this text about providence. The first observation is, is that... God's providence works through the actions of men. So the question of the text is, by whose decree? And if we were to 
to, to look at this on the surface, it might seem that it was by Cyrus's decree initially. We saw that in verses uh, 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 1 through 5 of, of chapter 6. And also, if we are to look at chapter 6, verse 14, it mentions Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes. But if you read closely in, in verse 14, it says that they finished building according to the decree of, of the God of Israel and the decree of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. So the question is, is whose, whose was it? Was it God's decree or was it man's decree? It surely can't be both, can it? Or can it? It can be. Because that is what theologians refer to as the doctrine of concurrence. That, that, that God is working in and through the actions of his creatures. That concurrence is the idea that God and humans act simultaneously to accomplish God's plan. And we've seen this already in the book of Ezra. The, the book of Ezra opens speaking to this, where in the very first verse of this book, it says, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. And even in this sixth chapter, if we were to skip down to verse 22, it says that, that God turned the heart of the king of Assyria toward them to encourage them in the work of the house of God. So that God had decreed that the, that the house would be built, but he did it in such a way that he worked through the kings of Persia, or as it, it called here, the kings of Assyria, that he was working through their actions. And we see this throughout the scriptures. The, the classic text for this is found in the book of Genesis. If you remember the story of Joseph when his brothers sold him into Egypt because they, they were envious of him. And he went down into Egypt and he went through all of his trials, all the imprisonment, and God eventually rose him up to the, the place of, of prominence to where he was second only to Pharaoh. And he went through all of the, the interactions with his brothers. And if you recall, after Jacob, their father, died, that his brothers became afraid. And they came to Joseph and they, and they said, Hey, Joseph, brother, before dad died, he told us to make sure that you're not mad at us for what we did to you. We did a lot of wrong to you, but, but he said that you should forgive us. And do you remember what Joseph said to them? It's, it's a classic text. He said, as for you, you meant, it, uh, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. You see how in that passage, the, the brothers of Joseph meant their deeds for evil. They had evil motives. They, they were acting. They were doing something. They are the ones who were responsible for selling him into Egypt. But yet God was also working concurrently at the same time, simultaneously, to bring about his purpose, a purpose for good, to preserve many people alive. We see this in our Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, in his crucifixion. Acts chapter 2 says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, Listen, this man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. That Peter could, could stand with confidence on the day of Pentecost and tell the men of Israel that Jesus died according to the predetermined plan of God, that God is the one who ordained this. He, through his foreknowledge and through his decree and through his plan, is the one who put Christ upon the cross. It was according to God's plan. But it was also through the acts of men who, through wicked hands, put Jesus to death upon the cross. And what's key here is, is to notice the motives. Yes, that, that, that God is working and man are working simultaneously, but the motives are important. We, we see that in, in God's use of, of the Assyrian Empire to, to chasten his people in terms of the Babylonian Empire. 
that, that Joseph's brothers meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. The men of Israel meant to crucify Christ for evil, but God meant it for good. And it's important for us to understand that because the question when we, when we begin to think about concurrence, the questions that come up is, well, is, if, if God has determined it, is he the one who is his forcing man's hand? Is God, in fact, the author of evil? Is God the one who brings about the evil if he has determined all things? Once again, our confession is very helpful in answering this. In chapter 3 of the confession, it says that God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass Yet so, as thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures, nor is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. That God is not the author of evil. The Bible teaches us that, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. He does not tempt any man. He does not force anyone's hand. That man has freedom. He might not have liberty. He might be, by nature, in bondage to sin in his will. But he is a free moral creature who will give an account for his actions. The Bible teaches us that every man must give an account for his actions. Every man must stand before God and give an account for what he has done in his flesh. So that's the the first thing that we see about providence, that it works through the actions of men. And this is a, a deep, deep mystery. And if, if, it's, if it's difficult for you to understand, that is, that is probably a good thing because we are talking about the workings of, of Almighty God. And it ought to cause us to, to marvel and wonder that God can do such things. But we also ought to remember that God is working in such a way in our lives that he is working through our actions. He is working through our decisions. He is working through the actions of those around us to bring about his purposes in our lives, that this is part of God's providence. The second observation that I would like to make from this text is that providence watches over God's people. Notice the the verse I read in chapter 5. It says, But the eye of their God was on the elders of the Jews, and they did not stop them, until a report could come to Darius, and then a written reply be returned concerning it. The guy, God, was, God was watching over his people. And actually, the word providence is a compound word of, of two Latin words. One is the word to see. The, 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 the second part of providence, the, the video, the video, that's where we get the word video, means to see. That God sees all things. That God knows all things. That's what the psalmist says in, in Psalm 139 when when he says, where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? Where can I flee from your eye? Where can I flee from your gaze? That he says that he cannot go anywhere that God does not see. And that certainly that is the, an aspect of God's providence that he is, that he is overseeing and looking for, for his people, looking out for their good. Jesus said, are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. That God knows the very hairs of your head. He knows everything that transpires in your life. He knows everything that, that, that is happening around you. He sees it. Remember Hagar. This is, this is what, what brought Hagar such comfort. When she was oppressed by, by Sarah, her, her mistress, And she ran away from Sarah, and she went out into the wilderness. Do you remember that God came to her in all of her trouble, and he said, I I see your trouble. I see. That's, That's Ishmael. God sees. God hears. He had heard her cry, and that that he he saw her trouble. And then she said, she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God of seeing. For she said, Truly here I have seen him who looks after me that God was looking after Hagar. He was looking after his people in 520 BC, and he's looking after us today. Is that a comfort to you? Is it a comfort to you that God sees all of your ways and and is intimately acquainted with, with, with your paths? 
know, unfortunately, sometimes the, the gaze of God is something that becomes a discomfort to us because of our sinfulness. That Adam in the garden, after he had sinned, became aware of his nakedness, and he sought to hide himself from the presence of God. But because we have the, the forgiveness of sins in Christ, we ought not to shrink from the gaze of God, knowing that he sees everything anyways. He knows all of our sin, that it ought to bring us comfort, that we, we ought to be like Hagar, who take great encouragement that God sees us in all of our affliction, that he hears our cries, and not be like Adam and Eve, who hid or at least attempted to hide from the gaze of God. But it, it's not just that God sees. God foresees. That's the pro. Providence. Providence. He sees things beforehand. And this plays out marvelously in this text. In, in the first five verses of, of chapter 6, as, as, as we see this search is, is, is undertaken, that supposedly there's this decree from Cyrus. Tatanai doesn't have the decree. Apparently the Jews didn't have it either because otherwise they would have just uh, showed Tatanai and his men and said, here's the decree from Cyrus. And we see that, that this search is taken to find this decree from Cyrus. And that God, years beforehand, had foresaw the need of this decree to be put in this, in this, in this house, that it would be found at the right time that he foresaw the need of his people. It's even interesting as we read in the first verse of the book of Ezra that it says that Cyrus not only made the proclamation throughout his kingdom, but that he also put it in writing. That God knew exactly what would be needed in the future because he had decreed the future and that he sees the future. And so he, he ordained that this edict, that this decree of Cyrus could be found for the good of his people. And it's actually pretty interesting as you look at it because originally Tatanai said to go and search in Babylon. Search in Babylon for this, this decree of Cyrus. But it wasn't found in Babylon. It was found in Ecbatana, which I can't remember, but it's something like 250 miles away. That Darius didn't stop in Babylon. That he continued to search until he found this. That God's, God's eye was upon his people. That his hand was upon his people for his good. That he had looked into the future. That he ordained the future. That, that, that Darius should find this decree of Cyrus. And that the work should go on. That providence looks forward. But it is something that we, we read backwards, isn't it? That's the, the famous words of, of John Flavel, that, that providence is like a Hebrew word. It is best read backwards. That might be somewhat biased to our Western language that we read from left to right, but the Hebrews read from right to left. And so Flavel says that we are to read providence backwards. We don't know what God is doing at any given time in our lives. But then that there's times where we can look back on our lives and we can see exactly what he was doing. Not always, but I trust that in glory we will be able to look back and see and read the providence of God, that we will, we will study his providence throughout all eternity as we see how he, how he, he, how he wove and interwove all the, the, the actions and the motives and the workings of men for his own purposes, and we will marvel at him for all of eternity, at this, this great being whose mind is so vast and so great to be able to, to, to weave such a tapestry and to bring about such purposes as he, as he does in, in carrying out his decrees. Okay, so the second observation, the first was that providence, it works through the actions of men. The second observation, that it watches over God's people. The third observation I would like us to note this evening is that it brings good out of evil. We see this in verses 6 and following, where Tatanai had, had sent to Darius to find this decree of Cyrus, that it, it appears that Tatanai was wanting to, to thwart the work. We see something of that in verse 5 of chapter 5, where it says that he did not stop them until the report could come. So here, Tatanai is, is, is not a friend of the Jews. He's not as evil, or at least as... As, as sinister as Rahum that we read about in chapter 4, he at least shows some integrity. But it's clear that he did not want this work to go on. 
that this would have been an evil in the sight of the Jews to have the work stop. But yet here we see how God works it together for good, don't we? That not only are they able to continue working, but that God brings peace to their labors, that God tells Tatanai and his colleagues, stay away, stay away from them, that they can work in peace. Not only does, does he bring peace, but he also brings provision, that he tells Tatanai that, that the work is to be paid for out of the taxes, out of the treasury of the proceeds of the taxes from the region beyond the river, that Tatanai, not only are you to stay away from the work, but you are also to pay for it that you are going to pay for all of the animals, all of the, the, the oil and, and the, the wheat and the salt and the wine and everything that the elders of the Jews need. And beyond that, it also brought protection. It brought peace, it brought provision, and it brought protection that we see this, this very, very clear warning from Darius that if they were not to carry out his edict, that they would be impaled. And this is something that, that the Persians did. This is the beginning of crucifixion, that they would impale people. If you look at the in, inscriptions, if you look in, in the, 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 the British Museum or other places where they have these, these, these works of art from the Persian period, you can see men impaled on stakes. And so here Darius says, if you do not carry out my decree, a beam will be taken from your house and you will be impaled on it and your house will become a refuse. You see how marvelous this is, that our God can bring good out of evil, that, that, that certainly the Jews must have thought this was a great evil. Remember that, that Tatanai came and said, give us your names. We want the names of the people who are building. And it, this wasn't a quick inquiry. They didn't have Google search back then. This, this, this wasn't just on some hard drive somewhere or even telephones where they could call from Judea over to Babylon and say, hey, Darius, check for this, this, this edict, this, this decree from Cyrus. Do you have it? No, they had to send a message all the way from Judea to Babylon, and then they had to search and not find it, and then they had to go from Babylon to perhaps Susa and look in Susa, and they didn't find it there, and then they had to go to Ecbatana and, and search, and, they didn't, and then they did find it. They finally found it. Then the word had to go back to Babylon, and then Darius had to give his decree, and it had to go all the way back. Just think of how these people would have been thinking for all that time. Yes, they're building, but with, with a, perhaps a certain dread. Yes, Haggai and Zechariah are ministering to them, but they're wondering all the time what is going to come of this. And we see that God can bring good out of evil. And we see this in no greater place in all of history than in the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth. No doubt the greatest evil that has ever occurred on this celestial ball, that there has never been a greater evil than the murder of Jesus Christ that he was, that he was the, the prince of life, the prince of peace, the only innocent man to ever tread upon this soil, that he had done nothing wrong. He went about doing good, healing people, giving sight to the blind, allowing the, the lame to walk, the dumb to, 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 to speak, the deaf to hear, that there was never a man like Jesus Christ. And yet he was placed upon a tree, he was cursed just as the men whom Darius said would be cursed. As it says in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree. And yet God in his marvelous providence, in his great wisdom, was able to take the greatest evil and bring about the greatest good that from the death of one man could, could result in the life of, of thousands, indeed millions, tens of millions of people. We see how God can bring good out of evil. This is true not just in the lives of these people, not just in the life of Christ, but it's true in your life as well. No doubt you're all familiar with that famous verse in the book of Romans where it says that God works together all things for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. That God is working together all the circumstances of your lives. And this isn't to deny evil. We're not Christian scientists here who say that evil is just an illusion. No, the scriptures are very clear that evil is, is, is something. Perhaps not a substance. If you're an Augustinian, you would say it's a deprivation. But nevertheless, the scripture acknowledges evil. It acknowledges the pain and the sufferings in our lives. 
And in, even in the short time I've, I've been amongst you, I, I see how there is suffering even in this congregation. But we have the promise of Scripture that God is able to work together all things in your life, including all the evils, all the pain, for your good. Okay, the third observation was that God's providence brings good out of evil. The final one is a, is a, is a short one. And it is that God's providence accomplishes his decrees. We see that in verses 13 and 15, focusing in, focusing in on verses 14 and 15. It says, And the elders of the Jews were successful in building through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of, Edu, of Ido. We saw that last time, that God accomplished his decree through the preaching of these men. It says, And they finished building according to the decree of the God of Israel. That God accomplished his decree. That indeed God has decreed whatsoever comes to pass. He knows the end from the beginning. He has, he has decreed it before he even spoke a single word of creation. Before he ever said, let there be light. He had ordained everything that would come to pass. And that through his providence, he is bringing his decrees to pass. That he uses secondary causes, contingencies, and, 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 and other things to accomplish his purpose, and that God will fulfill his purposes for you. He, know, he knew all of your days before there was but one of them. He knows every single thing that is ever going to happen to you. He has ordained it, and he, has, he is fulfilling his decrees through his providence in your life. Okay, so the four observations were that... It works through the option, or that providence works through the actions of men. It watches over God's people. It brings good out of evil. And it accomplishes God's decree. And we see that God did work providentially in this passage to bring about his decree. I want, as we close, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of, of Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest and the elders. Not so much in chapter 6. But in chapter 5, when Tat and I came to them and said, I want the names. I want the names of the people who are building here, and I want to know by whose decree are you doing this. What would have been going through your mind? What would have you been thinking? Would have you been thinking, hey, I'm just trying to do what God had told me to do. The prophets are here. They're, they're encouraging me. They're telling me to continue building, and I'm just trying to build. And now this evil comes upon me. I'm just trying to do the will of God in my life. And now I'm being harassed by Tatanai. It's, it's deja vu. It's, it's chapter 4 all over again. What, what would be going through your mind at that time? It's like Jacob, isn't it? Remember when, when the, the, his, his sons came back to him and, and they told him that, that, that Joseph had dealt harshly with them before they knew who Joseph was. Remember what Jacob said? He said, you have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more and Simeon is no more. And you would take Benjamin. All these things are against me. Jacob said, everything is against me. I wonder if Zerubbabel and Joshua were thinking that way. Everything is against me. I wonder if you've ever thought that way. I wonder if you're thinking that way now. It seems that everything in your life is against you. Now imagine if somebody could have, could have, could have traveled in time from from chapter 6, back to Zerubbabel and said, you're never going to believe what God is going to do. That all of these circumstances are going to turn out for your good. That actually Tatanai is going to have to end up paying for the whole work. And that this, this work is going to be completed in four and a half years. God is going to do marvelous things. How do you think that would have affected the, the mind of Zerubbabel and Joshua and the builders of the temple? Do you think it would have had an impact on them and how they faced the the opposition and the trials of their life? Okay, well, now I'm going to ask you, knowing what you know about Revelation 21 and 22, what God has ordained for you, the good that he has ordained for you, that you are going to spend eternity with your heavenly Father, that he is going to wipe away every tear, that he is going to work all things together for your good, that there will be no more evil, there will be no more pain, there will be no more suffering, that you will be with him for eternity. How ought that to impact how you think about God's providence and his trials in your life today?
Will it change the way you think about things? Will it change the way you see the, the hand of God in your life? Beloved, in the words of Scripture, be anxious for nothing. Let your requests be known to God. I close with the words of the hymn, Be Still My Soul. We're going to sing this in a moment. Listen to this. Be still my soul. Not just my soul, but your soul. The Lord is on your side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change he faithful will remain. Be still my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend. Through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Let's pray. Oh Lord, how marvelous your providence is. How marvelous your mind is. Lord, we cannot begin to plumb the depths of it because we know that it is unfathomable, that you are infinite in your being and in your mind, in your thinking. We look forward to spending eternity trying to unweave all that you have worked this side of the grave so that we can worship and marvel and praise you for all eternity for all the things that you have done. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hold on, I've got to get my bulletin. Be still my soul is six.